um, yeah, it's 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 really a great pleasure and, and, and great to welcome you here, Ariana. So Ariana Menchasi is um, at SSSA, um, which is, I try this now, uh, Sculio, Sculo Superiore Santana near Pisa. And um, I um, I believe you have been there for many years now and uh, mm -hmm. you did your PhD there. I think that was with Paolo Dario. Um, a few years ago, and uh, you became then uh, also a professor at uh, at the school, and you are now also the vice principal or vice dean for the for the university. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. But of course, most importantly, you have been really influential in the in the area of medical robotics and have been contributing enormously. Um, uh, really amazing, and um, yeah, I I, uh, I look forward to seeing your presentation today. And where you, I suppose, will speak about medical robotics. <laughs> yes, Gaspar, thank you so much, and uh, thanks for to all people attending. It's always very difficult to speak to people that you don't know exactly, you don't know that the the path. So I try to put together some let's say, uh, lesson learned that I had. And if you have any question, I have time until 1 p.m. So if you have any question, you can also interrupt me. I cannot check the, the, the chat online, but you can interrupt or you can ask at the end as you, as you prefer. So I yep. start just sharing to, the screen. Yes, yeah, please. Just to, just to clarify, when you say 1 o'clock, for us it's 12 o'clock. Uh, so. Yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> good yeah good so you're available until 12 perfect thanks a okay. lot yeah okay okay you share the screen yes we can see that and now it's coming okay. yeah perfect. perfect perfect so uh, the title of this short talk today is Trends and Technical Solution for Minimal Invasive Surgery in Targeted Therapy in My Experience in the Field. So quite uh, wide, but let's try to focus from the, the beginning. And I uh, like to focus starting uh, from two exercises, two exercises that I, I, I did in the last two years, basically. Uh, the first one is this one. Uh, you, you can find also, or I can send the reference, or you can find on the web. This is a review paper published uh, uh, thanks to the uh, support of uh, um, uh, leading action of Pierre Dupont on science robotics. It is quite strange because normally when you prepare review, you describe what happened and you are asked to identify the next grand challenges. In this case, it was a little bit different because uh, in order to plan for the future, uh, we have to have a clear understanding of what the research community accomplished in the past. And if this work accomplished in the past is something that is used at clinical level and it is commercialized. So we tried to identify, and it was not easy, uh, the eight key research themes in medical robotics over the past decade to analyze the highly cited papers of the decade and to, to look at the result and to see if we, we are satisfied as researchers. Okay, these are the most cited papers. Is it okay? This is something that as a future, this is something already at the market level or maybe not because 10 years is a long period, especially for students you are young. So 10 years is, wow, too long. But 10 years for the development of a medical device is a very, very short period because even if an idea is extremely appealing, you have to wait for preclinical trial, clinical trial, certification for the drug, regulation, blah, blah, blah. So it, it, it is not a problem if you find some interesting and very highly cited papers dated back uh, 2011 and not yet on the market. This is normal. We have to prepare another review in 10 years. 
This was the first exercise, as I mentioned, and uh, uh, these are the eight key areas that we analyze it. A couple of areas are related to rehabilitation robotics because the paper was about um, medical robotics in general, but there is uh, uh, laparoscopy, uh, so laparoscopic robots, not laparoscopic robots, and soft robotics, capsule robot, continuum robots, magnetic actuating robots. And uh, this is a, one of the pictures coming from the, from the paper where you see the years and the number of papers. They are the most cycled papers. And you can observe a huge growth of the uh, field of medical uh, magnetic actuation, soft robotics, continuum robots, and medical capsules. So I presented something like that on Saturday during a Congress of Clinical Robotics, and they were very upset. No, it's impossible because we are using Da Vinci, so there are more publications on Da Vinci, but not society, because this is already a traditional technology in a sense. This fails related to continuous soft uh, magnetic acti activated robots medical capsule are the most, let's say, uh, cited in the last 10 years. So maybe in the future we will assist to a growth of these fields. Okay, this was my first exercise, but I promised that there were two different exercises. And the second one is this one. Together with a, a team of uh, um, colleagues, uh, Russ Taylor was the uh, leader in this case, we were asked to uh, prepare a special issue for the proceedings of the IEEE. Proceedings of the IEEE um, are not dedicated to forecast the future, but to prepare book chapter, let's say, for students uh, for knowing the state of the art of a certain area and having something solid as a reference. Together with uh, uh, Kasper, Professor Altofer, we prepared the contribution on soft robotics assisted minimal invasive surgery. Also, in this case, selecting the titles was not easy for me, Russ, Nabil, and Guanzong, because you have not only to uh, speak about the last fashion, but to speak about something that we think is mature, even if not yet completely deployed, and it deserves to be studied. And again, also in this, in this issue, there are uh, several examples of um, uh, contribution on continuum robots, flexible robot technologies, where uh, there is a, a, a strong trend towards the not only the minimal invasive, but also the uh, flexibility of robotics. So, putting together these two exercises and thinking about what I had the privilege also to, uh, to know in advance, a little bit before the readers, these are the main challenges and the main needs that I, I can identify. So the first one is helping the surgeon to reach unreachable areas. The second is bringing dexterity inside the body with minimal access and with high performance actuator. Another very relevant need is being safe. Being safe uh, safety is one of the main issues if you develop any medical robots. But being safe in interaction with tissues that are not, uh, that can be delicate and not very well structured. So, in principle, you don't know if you find a delicate tissue. You have no optics normally. So, it, it's something very uh, critical in minimal invasive surgery. And the last issue is moving towards scarless surgery. So uh, today I, I will try to present my personal navigation, let's say, among the above challenges without a specific order, but going step by step and answering this or, or, or giving some example for these main challenges. So, okay. During my uh, uh, experience, one of the main topics for my activity was to 
deploy degrees of freedom inside the body with a minimal access. So from the engineering viewpoint, uh, this is really fascinating. So imagine that you have a hole. It doesn't matter if it is rigid or not rigid. It can be also a hole in a sphere. And you have to deploy inside the holes as many degrees of freedom as you want, because, OK, you have to do some uh, some task in the body. Normally, one of the most critical tasks is suturing, and suturing requires uh, so many degrees of freedom that are familiar for us when we are doing traditional manual tasks, but they can be extremely complicated for a robot. I understood that before this presentation, there was something related to Da Vinci. So Da Vinci is a reference for this, that the maneuverability of the wrist of Da Vinci is a reference. And Da Vinci um, is also a, a problem for people approaching this field because they uh, have, uh, they yet and they have also now many patents. And so they, uh, at the time of this project that I will illustrate in a minute, uh, they had uh, tons of patents about wrist actuation by cable and tendons. So in the Da Vinci, the motors are outside, you have long tendons ma uh, for maneuvering the small wrist. So we tried to deploy degrees of freedom with a different approach. So developing a couple of arms, as you can see in the movie, the two arms can be deployed through a small axis, this introducer, together with the camera. And the actuation of the arms, at least for the wrist and for the elbow, are inside the arm, as in our arm. So you have the muscle, not all the muscle in our back. You have muscle distributed along the arm. In this way, that uh, we fabricated something that was uh, extremely good in terms of patentability because it was an arm actuated by motors integrated in the arm. We obtained a very good transmission ratio because having a, uh, avoiding tendons, we had the possibility to develop eye force and eye torque directly on the tip with a direct driving solution. And so the motors are not huge because there is no need of huge robot because there is no friction of the cables. So the motors are quite small and each arm is less than 15 millimeter in diameter. Um, at the end, if we have time, I will explain why um, this result was a very good result in terms of engineering design, very inspiring also for other groups, but there is no product at the moment with the, uh, this design uh, for problems related to um, sterilizability of motors. Because I remember when we asked some companies to develop for us motors that you can sterilize, and the answer was yes, perfect. We need one, two years of development, but this is not an issue. You can wait. And we need to start from a minimal amount of 60,000 motors. So, incredible. So, for deploying degrees of freedom uh, through, uh, 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 deploying a degrees of freedom through a small hole can be even more interested, interesting if you can do uh, really without any scare. So there are already some holes in our body. Uh, one is the mouth, esophagus. So uh, why not uh, using this modular motorized solutions to build a sort of uh, surgical room inside the body? From the clinical viewpoint, what you can see here is what is called a transgastric operation. So you enter with an endoscope, a gastroscope, through the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, then you perforate the stomach and you enter the abdominal cavity and you can do a cholecystectomy. This is an, a, a very challenging operation because you have limited degrees of freedom. And so medical doctors were asking for more degrees of freedom uh, to be deployed through a small 
natural whole and a small inter in intentional hole in the gastric cavity. I have to say that in this case, we were not able, we did some in vivo uh, tests on animal, but the, the complete platform was uh, extremely challenging to be built. So what you can see here in the top left is something that we realized just in part. But this activity was uh, again very inspiring because, for example, we developed some uh, small tools to be used alone as a magnetic retractor or a, a sort of modular camera to be deployed uh, inside the abdominal cavity and just based on the same design, this one, that you can replicate changing only the Deep actuators. Also, in this case, you have a module with two motors inside, so two degrees of freedom that you can use for several applications, pitch, roll, rasping, and so on. In all these cases, the attachment to the external, um, to the internal wall of the, of the abdominal cavity was done by magnetic field. But on this topic, I will um go back uh, in a, a few minutes on a different chapter of this presentation. We explored the problem of deploying uh, minimal invasive uh, tools with uh, many degrees of freedom inside the body, also for different applications, not only for abdominal surgery, but also for earth application. Nowadays, many uh, aortic um, valve replacement are done by using catheters. And they are very useful, especially for elderly people, because elderly people cannot support and uh, sustain uh, an open heart surgery. But for a younger person, it's very relevant to uh, have an aortic valve replacement with extreme precision because uh, uh, for a, a, a young person, young is something as me and Caspar, okay? Not young as students, <laughs> but me and Caspar are young. <laughs> Now, because my students, when I, I say this is for young adult, and they ask me, okay, 20 years old, no, young adult is as me. <laughs> okay, you, 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 so, are young. you are young, you are young. Uh, but I, I think we are the same age. So uh, in this case, as you can see in this part of the movie, the operation of aortic valve replacement is done by making an incision between two ribs and entering the earth and approaching the valve. So you need something extremely flexible, but also stiff enough because you need flexibility to navigate different anatomies. You need something empty in the middle because inside the, the, this medical device, there is the valve to be deployed and the valve uh, is not a, a a micro size valve and you have to deploy the valve with eye precision by aligning the valve uh, to some reference anatomies of the aortic anus. So what we did was a cable actuated system with the possibility to uh, have a, a good bending but also to rigidify in position controlling the force and we uh, put on the we put on the on the tip three small cameras. Um, a group of colleagues from the Pisa University were able to, uh, was able to um, let's say mix these three cameras views in order to have a better viewing of the of the annulus and the better alignment. Uh, so, in this case, the, the system is a flexible robot, vertebrated, fabricated by um, metal, as what you have seen in the previous, um, in the previous examples. So, if you consider all these examples that are just a part of the state of the art, my, my navigation in the field, 
they are multi-articulated with wrist, elbow and shoulder or with a vertebrate solution. And the main ingredients are links, gears, cables and metals. You, we, we were using metals for rigid polymers. We have problems with actuation because when the actuation is distal, so it is on the tip, you need some very highly, highly miniaturized uh, motors. So if the actuation is proximal, as in the Da Vinci, for example, the force and the dexterity at the tool tip are very limited, or if they are large, it is because external actuators are really huge. So together with uh, some colleagues working in soft robotics and together with Casper, I have to say, um, we observed that uh, there was an emerging research field, the research field of soft robotics. Originally, soft robotics was just for, let's say, understanding better how an octopus can move, understanding better how the elephant trunk can manipulate stuff. But there was a growing interest towards uh, tunable stiffness uh, material, very complicated to be controlled, but why not trying, and materials that can be shrinked. And for me, uh, with this uh, long lasting experience on surgical robotics, the shrinking ability is something special. Because when you have a shrink, uh, some, some material that you can shrink, uh, you have not to play with the submillimetric precision. I remember when a medical doctors asked us, okay, I need a manipulator 11 millimeter in diameter. And for example, uh, our answer was, okay, we have a motor 11 millimeter, but I need a little bit of external case. So it is 12 and five, no 11, because 11 is my entry port. With the shrinking ability, you can play with something larger to shrink and to deploy. So a crazy idea, maybe yes. When Casper proposed this idea, I think that most researchers uh, thought it was crazy. Crazy, but with uh, some good results. So uh, these are uh, some uh, results obtained together with the, the team of Casper and the team of Steve Flop in the past years. So, okay. So um, we started to uh, design robot by using silicon and pneumatic or hydraulic actuation with the ability to shrink, to elongate, to bend very much, and integrating some tools or camera, as in this movie that is taken uh, from a, a, a cadaver experiment. And the nice idea is that one typical question was, okay, so in the future, all the tools will be replaced by soft tools. So why you need a total replacement? You can also combine traditional tools and novel tools for doing something special. So this is, uh, in the last two movies, you see some experiment that we uh, did together, uh, some colleagues in Verona, Paolo Fiorini team, and we used a, a uh, tunable stiffness and soft camera combined with a traditional uh, Da Vinci tool in a Da Vinci research kit. And we asked some medical doctors to see uh, the, the working area with this different orientation. And we were quite surprised to see that after a few minutes, medical doctors were not disappointed and they learned quite fast to see the dark side of the moon, let's say, because they had some vision of the working area that was not the traditional vision uh, that they got during a, a traditional Da Vinci operation. So, summing up what we have seen, we have seen uh, different approaches for actuation. So in all wired devices that we have seen, we have 
two possible um, uh, solution devices with onboard actuation but external powering as in the case of the pneumatic soft robots so you have the, the uh, compressor outside you have flexible tubes and you have the actuation inside or devices with all proximal actuation based on cable driven and tandem mechanism so everything outside so what we have seen, for example, with Da Vinci is the second example. What we have seen with the first robot with motors inside or with the, the soft robot is this first solution. In both solutions, you have problems of connection. Connection can be, uh, in the first case, tubes and simple electrical connection, or connection can be uh, tendons that are used for the activation of the mechanism. So in my experience, we um, was uh, uh, we were invited to think something all on board to develop capsule, capsule robot. So all on board caps uh, wireless devices. For all on board wireless devices, you need to put everything inside, powering, actuation. No, no tubes, no electrical connection, no tendons are allowed. In this case, this is not easy uh, because even if you are using pneumatic or hydraulic actuation, having everything on board as something that clash uh, with miniaturization constraints. So, which are the solution for a real scarless surgery that in principle can be done uh, also without any uh, incision? So briefly, I am going to illustrate two solutions based on wireless energy sources. One based on magnetic fields and the second one based on ultrasound. Concerning magnetic field, this is a very basic explanation of what happened to what happens, sorry, to a magnetic object or a magnetized object uh, put in a magnetic field. So uh, there is a generation of a torque that is proportional to the magnetic field, and there is a generation of a force that is proportional to the gradient of the magnetic field. This is what you can experience also taking a small magnet and putting some, uh, putting ar around some uh, iron particles. So by using this idea, uh, my group, but not only my group, but many group in the world developed magnetic capsule. And this is the reason of the huge interest and highly cited papers at the beginning in my first exercise, because many groups develop a magnetic capsule that can be moved along the gastrointestinal tract with the transportation by an external coil or an external permanent magnets. What you have seen is for the GI tract and um, a size lumen that has few centimeters. But nowadays, there are also a solution for millimeter size lumen and for the vascular system. What you can see here in this couple of movies are two platforms that have been developed. The, okay, the first one in uh, Switzerland at ATH, it is called Navium. The second one is uh, a magnetic navigation system produced in, uh, uh, by Stereotaxis and USA. So basically what they are doing. So in the Stereotaxis system, you have this large expansion. It seems an MRI, an open MRI. And this large expansion are um, hosting two large magnets and electromagnets. And when you, as you can see here, when you modulate the, the, the field of these magnets, a small magnetic catheter can be displaced in the middle. 
And the uh, uh, first case, uh, I, I want to go back because, uh, sorry, because this system is doing the same, but the team producing this system is very, very good in the control of magnetic field. And so all the magnets are here and there's a uh, um, three-shaped uh, structure. So you don't need to wrap the patient, but this is very well, um, uh, it is very easy to be integrated in a surgical room where you have also um, fluoroscopy for monitoring the uh, position of the catheter that can be catheter for the brain or for the earth. And the medical doctor has not to know all the um, equations behind the magnetic field control because there is a, a very um, user-friendly interface and with a simple joystick, you can uh, move the catheter inside the vascular system. But it is also possible to go to smaller body lumina. And this is the field of micro and nanorobotics, in vivo application of micro and nanorobotics. This is a little bit science fiction, so tons of particles in the vessels and targeting an area with the cancer in the liver, for example. Uh, but the translation to relevant clinical scenario is very long because you have not to develop small particles to be um, um, delivered in the blood vessels, but you have also to find a solution for the imaging, because in some cases fluoroscopy is not enough, for the locomotion control, for the therapy delivery, for the biocompatibility and safety. And related to the, 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 the talk of today, I want to give you just an example of the possible introduction of micro nanorobotic solution in in vivo application under magnetic field and to approach the problem of biocompatibility and safety. So how facing the biodistribution of magnetic particles in the body and managing the magnetic partic particles not contributed to the therapy? So which is the problem? I showed this movies and I uh, introduced the problem. The problem is that if you deliver some magnetic particles inside the vessel and you hope that putting a magnet outside is enough to, uh, to allow the particles to stop here, so your, your, your hope uh, fails. Why? Uh, because uh, in the vessels, there is the pressure of the blood, uh, and the blood is very effective in deviating the particles. So what happens? It happens that if you deliver one, two, three particles in a vessel, this is a carotid with the, the, the feature of carotids, even if you have a magnets outside, only a, a, a limited percentage of particles are going in the area of interest. All the others flow away. This is the problem of biodistribution. So if the particles are biocompatible or biodegradable, no problem. But the main limitation of micro nanorobotics towards in vivo application is that you have to take care of all the particles not contributing to the therapy because they are not contributing to the therapy and this can be a problem. But the main problem is that they, they are spread around. So briefly, uh, we, we found some solution the state of the art. For example, there are groups working on reverse locomotion to be able to uh, keep back the, the, the particles after uh, their use. But this is extremely complicated from the control point of view not straightforward for large blood flow, for example. And there are also some filtration solutions. They are not coming from engineering. They are coming more from medicine. So there are solutions for filtrating the blood after chemotherapy. So we thought something similar. We could fabricate a sort of magnetic filter to take the particles that are not used for the therapy.
So filtration catheters uh, are normally used for chemotherapeutics and they are drug specific. But if we want to catch magnetic particle, we have to build a magnetic filter with a different design uh, process. So this is what we, uh, we did. So first of all, let's consider a simple yet relevant case. Organs with terminal circulation. What do I mean for terminal circulation? I mean organs such as the liver, but also the kidney and pancreas, where you have one input vessel and one output vessel. So the idea was, okay, I can put my magnetic drug in the input vessel. The drug can be accumulated in the liver, in the area of liver where I need my therapy. But for sure, many particles will uh, not be captured in this area. And so they will go out and outside. You can find the filter, a magnetic filter, to catch the uh, particles not contributing to the therapy and to be uh, to distribute again the, uh, the clean uh, blood. So we uh, fabricated the catheter with a magnetic module, a tip of balloon for anchoring to the vessel, and the depletion module for uh, uh, making the blood available again in the in the um, uh, circulatory system. This is the, the uh, positioning of the catheter, and this is the magnetic module. Okay, designing this magnetic model was not easy, so there is some math behind, okay? Uh, because you have to consider this, the, the velocity of the particles, you have to consider a uh, problem of hemorrhagology, uh, you have to uh, put together several constraints in terms of diameter, magnet numbers, grouping of the magnets, and particles dimension. I don't enter the detail, but at the end of the story, we fabricated our magnetic filter. We tested in a sort of experimental validation in vitro, and uh, uh, we analyzed if the filter was effective to keep to keep the particle. These are the results. So what we found was a very good agreement between experimental and fan prediction and the inability to catch, cat, uh, to catch the particle with 90% of efficiency for 500 nanometers particle and 80% of efficiency with 250 nanometers. And even if you are using this filter for multiple passage, no problem, they can work as the first time, basically. In addition, we didn't observe a significant hemorrhological alteration. So blood cells count and hemocryptocrit was very good at the beginning as at the end. This was just an example uh, to, to, to show you not only the uh, drawing, but also a little bit of the design, the calculation and simulation behind. So, uh, as I mentioned, if you want a scarlet surgery, one solution is relying on magnetic fields, another solution is relying on ultrasound. I am pretty sure that you are uh, quite familiar with ultrasound that are used for echography, for diagnosis. But maybe you know that if you take a sort of acoustic lens, you can um, focus the ultrasound energy in one spot that is not very small. It is a couple of millimeters, as illustrated in the picture. And in this spot, you can focus and deposit a huge energy, energy that can contribute to the tissue heating, so thermal effect, or energy that can uh, release mechanic mechanical uh, energy in the form of cavitation. This solution can be used to treat cancer. And uh, uh, the, the idea is not new, but which is the problem of treating cancer in this way? The problem is that you, you see here, I, I stopped the movie. 
This is a, a, a patient with breast cancer inside a magnetic resonance imaging uh, machine. And the breast cancer is in a lucky position because the coupling is quite easy and the, the breast is not moving with the breathing. But if you have the same cancer in the liver or in the kidney, how to make everything flexible and also effective under breathing condition? So our idea was to combine focused ultrasound surgery that was already discovered with robotics. So adding flexibility to the overall therapeutic solution without any scar, everything is wireless. What you can see in the first small movie is the original research platform that we developed. It was based on two robots, one with the uh, Fox ultrasound uh, uh, probe, the other one with a 3D probe for navigation. And uh, uh, this is a typical scenario of robot-assisted surgery and image-guided surgery. Because uh, thanks to some uh, imaging and preparative imaging, we were able also to track the organs and to um, shoot on the organs under respiration. Nowadays, the uh, platform is, um, sorry, I, I want to show you here. Okay, so you see this area is the treated area. This is the cooked area, let's say. It is uh, breast chicken, so this is uh, white. Around, everything is safe and also uh, above it is safe. You are just with a good coupling through water, you are just focusing and treating this area. So I was mentioning that nowadays that the platform uh, is a little bit different. Uh, we uh, are intending to deploy the platform also for um, for veterinary use and to make something quite uh, uh, low cost. So we are using a single arm with the confocal ultrasound probe, but the principle is basically the, the, the same principle. We um, obtained uh, some good results in terms of usability in a clinical environment, tracking in vivo with a precision less than one millimeter, and also safety and efficacy of the treatment. The very last example that I want to show um, for explaining my navigation in the, uh, in, the, in the field is related to training, because what I learned in my uh, uh, career is that, okay, as engineers, we like very advanced robotic tools uh, with many, many options. But these tools have to be um, usable and easy to be used. You cannot afford, also from the economic viewpoint, uh, training costs that, that are impossible. So, um, Advanced robotic tools require also advanced high fidelity simulators. In the last years, and nowadays with a small sponsorship by Intuitive, we are developing a sensorized uh, um, phantom to be used in training. In this specific case, we are collaborating with thoracic surgeons for a specific task that is the isolation resection of the pulmonary vine uh, in lung lobectomy. Uh, we developed this phantom that are uh, very similar to the, to the real uh, organs uh, with different difficulty, levels of difficulties. For example, in the first case, you have only the vein. In the second case, you have also to cut the fat before reaching the vein. And the vein is sensorized. So if you stretch too much, 
you um, there is a beep, there are some alarms, and so you have to uh, be good and doing the task without a major stretching. We are still now in the um, validation of the system. We tested the 60 euro users during the ambulance symposium in the summer, and about 32 uh, surgeons now in, um, in Tuscany attending training course with the Da Vinci. Okay, I want to conclude my, uh, my talk today with some final consideration. So we are assisting to a stable trend for multi-articulated and luminal continuum robotic solutions. This is for sure, based on my two exercises and by the analysis of the state of the art. There is a, a strong attention to soft technologies, uh, not only because we are crazy engineers, but for guaranteeing intrinsic safety that is very relevant for medical doctors. Wireless surgery by robotic beam steering, robotic beam steering for ultrasound, but also for radiotherapy, and magnetic forces are a hot topic if we want to go in the direction of scarless surgery. But there is another trend that I have not considered because, as you have seen, my presentation was more related to the hardware, to the problem of actuation. Nowadays, there is much uh, discussion about the inclusion of artificial intelligence and uh, robotics for medical application. Artificial intelligence can promote the democratization of healthcare. If you see all the uh, last example of surgical robots, there is a huge attention towards digital surgery, data, 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 collection of data for improving surgery. And there is also another trend this is a picture coming from one of the papers that I have described at the beginning, and it is about automation. Okay, the full automation of a surgical procedure with a, 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 a robotic surgeon is something very, very future. Maybe it will never happen. But the automation in terms of robot assistance, of task autonomy, is already a reality opening major issues also uh, related to safety and responsibility. So in consideration of all these rumors, the question is auto autonomy and artificial intelligence are or will be more impactful than robotics in terms of hardware? I don't know. So the, I, I leave you with this question. I thank you for your attention and I am here for any further question if you have. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Ariana. Brilliant, brilliant overview and uh, really very good to hear um, yeah, your views on, on the various areas of medical robotics. Um, yeah, fantastic. I am really impressed. Uh, any questions? I have a number of questions. I've written them down. Um, and since there are no questions from the audience at the moment, maybe I start with my questions. Um, so maybe I can kind of start at the very end, actually, because that is really something uh, I'm also, you know, thinking about. Um, so you're talking about autonomy and uh, using AI and machine learning. And now you're even um, suggesting that these techniques are more important than robotics, but uh, how can that be? I mean, don't we need the robotic device to actually do something? I mean, e even if we do it remotely, let's say through ultrasound, still some hardware is needed. So, um, so why do you say that? <laughs> no, I, 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 this is not this is provocative, because mm -hmm. you you know me and uh, I. I I like more the machine, the artwork. I think this is the, the, the real stuff that you need and it has to be reliable. 
And in some cases, uh, um, it is provocative also because it seems that data have been discovered just three years ago. But if you read the one of the first paper and the I have here the moments. <laughs> I have, I have here this book. It was donated by Paolo Dario. It is Computer Integrated Surgery, the first book of a computer integrated surgery by Russ Taylor, Stefan Lavalle, Grigor Bourdet, Ralph Mosges. So data, we are already here. So if you um, uh, speak about computer integrated surgery or image guidance, image guidance means that you have some digital information, you make some analysis of this digital information, and you are driving your tool. So you are taking a decision of the direction of operation based on images. This is already, in fact, Russ Taylor says, OK, I did that analysis already. But nowadays, in my opinion, it is also a matter of fashion. For sure, we have technologies that can do much more than in the past because we have very fast machines for computing and you can analyze images very very fast and you can collect much more data uh, and it it makes sense for example uh, to to collect data from da vinci or from other platforms to understand to to make a relationship between the the um, the result of the medical operation and the data of the encoder, for example, to see if there is any correlation. It is important also in terms of responsibility to say, OK, the medical doctor could say I was extremely good with this operation, but the patient is not in good condition. So let's see the, the data. Um, so th it's also a matter of fashion, but this is not something extremely new in my in my view but there is also another thing that uh, we were discussing uh, on saturday during this conference on clinical robotics at the end of the story in terms of hardware even if you can consider the da vinci in terms of hardware so the wrist was fantastic the wrist is still fantastic and i think that we cannot build a cable activated wrist better than the da vinci wrist with the same technology because they, they did top level activities and they improved many things but not the wrist so we have to look for disruptive technologies and uh, magnetic field can be in this line but they have some problem of certification soft technologies can be disruptive and in this case, we need some uh, progress in the field of, this is my, my feeling, in the field of uh, pumping and valve. So soft valve, soft pump to be better integrated. Otherwise, you, have, you remember, lots of cables, tubes around. Lots of tubes, yes. Lots of tubes. But again, um, if you consider the, the, the first uh, graph of the, 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 the paper by Science Robotics, there is much expectation. And in my opinion, we have just to work for, OK, let, 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 let's, uh, uh, let's uh, leave the others to work on uh, the part more related to, that is important to artificial intelligence and autonomy. but. Let's try also to work on the hardware, not only in terms of design, but in terms of components. I uh, yep. always suggest my, my students, if they are interested in surgical robotics, for example, uh, don't read only papers on surgical robotics. You, you find the papers on the use of the Da Vinci or of the Ugo platform, that is fantastic also, and many others. But look also at the conference about, for example, actuator source sensors to find the components, for example, also for 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 tubes, <laughs> so many tubes. Yeah. I remember yeah. a paper by published on science robotics by uh, 
the, the, the father of soft lithography, is about flexible valve to be integrated inside the modular robot. So yeah. this can be a yeah. disruptive technology for. That's that's what we need. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So good. You're still on the hardware side. I like that. Um, I have many more questions, but probably don't have time for everything. But uh, you you also mentioned that you're looking at the veterinary approach. So using or making new robotic devices and then using them on animals. That sounds very interesting to me because first of all, you possibly can help the animals to to live longer. But secondly, um, you hopefully learn something that could you could apply then for the the in the human medical field. So what is your experience there? Um, how how much can we learn from that kind of work? So there are a couple of consideration. One consideration that is very, I'll say, uh, to 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 make faster the deployment is that uh, when you have to sell a, a medical robot for uh, human use, you need medical certification, that is crazy. If you want to sell a robot for uh, veterinary use, you need just the CA mark, the, 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 the same mark that you need for a traditional machine. So the certification is much faster. Even if you have to prove the effectiveness, uh, the safety and so on, but the certification is faster. At the same time, it's also an ethical issue. You know that for all the preclinical studies, as you have seen in one of the picture, you need pigs, normally pigs or sheep. So, uh, they are limited, limited, uh, they are limited case. Um, there are strict protocols, but anyhow, they are animals. There is the possibility to avoid ethical issue to use cadavers, but for example, I and cadaver cannot be combined. And cadavers, they have no blood. So having a sort of preclinical um, uh, experience with in the veterinary market, in the veterinary field, means that you are not only using the animal for doing the test, but also for treating them, even if it is an experimental treatment. But yep. as in the case of ultrasound, even if it is experimental, there is no pain. If it is not effective, it can happen, unfortunately, but many. Uh, treatment are not uh, effective, unfortunately, for humans and for animals. No. So uh, this is an ethical issue to be considered. Uh, I, I have a couple of postdocs that are trying to make a spin-off now for the veterinary use of the uh, robot. And helping them, I have discovered a, a, a very interesting word. And, uh, and now when I say patient, I, I think about a small dog because they, they are considered patient. And so, you, for example, tests on this vet patient are considered clinical tests, not preclinical, because they are the, the patient. Yeah. Yeah, so no. something yeah, to learn. Good. Fantastic. No, sounds very good. I, I definitely f I'm interested and I, I have to look into it a bit myself uh, and definitely an interesting way forward and hopefully also useful then for the for the for the humans uh, who are uh, patients and who are ill. Good. Um, thank you very much again. Fantastic presentation. I forgot to ask at the beginning. Um, is it was it okay that we recorded the whole session? Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. No problem. And and, and uh, can I share that with the students? Yes, sure, no problem. And you can share also my my email if they have additional question, they okay. can deliver to you or directly to me. If I don't answer uh, at the first. Try again, drop another exactly. email because exactly. you know, Caspar, we are receiving tons of emails. So, so yes, in many cases, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, this is yes, just yeah. impossible to, to look at all messages. So sometimes something slips through, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you would you be also okay to share your slides? Uh, 
Yes, yes, sure, sure. So I I, I can uh, send you a PDF version and uh, okay. PDF or whatever you want. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And um, so you know Kawai Quok. Do you know Kawai? Yeah, yeah. Kwok? Yeah. So he 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 gave also a presentation. He said mm -hmm. he he would be also interested in seeing the presentations by others. So I'm wondering whether I can share the your 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 presentations also more widely. Yeah, OK, yes, uh, I think in general, Casper, that uh, you, you did a great job in putting together as far as understood the several presentation from many experts. So uh, and this is for teaching. So in consideration yeah. of the, the what we learn from pandemics, if there is a, a website where you collect everything, uh, and maybe the, that's the what I other should do. I thinking about it. Yeah. Yes, maybe for for for, for the public or at least for exactly. our classes. Why yeah, not? Yeah, yeah. I th I think and and I mean thanks again to you. I mean your presentation was fantastic. The others are also fantastic. Right. It's I'm so humbled, you know, that you put so much effort into it. So many thanks again. Much thanks were well done together, Prosper. <laughs> many yeah. things that thanks. I presented were well done together. Thanks, thanks for mentioning me. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much and uh, good seeing you and I see you around for ICRA anyway. <laughs>